to the Domestic Draft Podcast, Dan. We're back from spring break. We had the week off. I'm happy to be back, though. Great. I see you cracked a beer. What are you? Uh, what are you drinking? Start us up. Uh, Made West Ventura, not quite San Diego Ventura. If you're not familiar with that is, it's kind of um, northwest of LA, about an hour, sixty miles northwest on the coast there. But the brewery is called Made West Brewing Company. Uh, started by two friends. Um, so I'll talk about them first and the, and the brand, and then I'll talk about the beer, but, uh, Mike Morrison is a home brewer. He was living in San Diego actually. So there is that connection there and decided to move back to his hometown of Ventura to like pursue his goal of opening up a brewery. Uh, his friend, um, funny enough was a, um, private equity investment CFO for eight years. So he had some, uh, you know, experience okay. uh, managing uh, money and um, he was able to then kind of help his buddy out uh, with his pursuit of a brewery and they partnered up together, bought some space and started brewing beer. Um, and they started brewing some really good beer. Um, they have two tasting rooms up in Ventura. Uh, their beer won some awards. So the one that I'm drinking is their standard blonde. I'm kind of back on my Pilsner and just easy drinking beer kick after kind of being into hazies for a minute. Um, but it's, um, won, uh, 20, 2018, it won gold at the great American beer festival for a blonde or golden ale in 2017, it won silver at the California state fair for blonde ale. So it's an award-winning beer. It gets 3.5 and untapped and it's just clean, crisp, sessionable, light ale. Uh, again, one gold in 2018. Um, uh, and it's got hops from Bavaria. It's got Saz hops and, uh, Mandarin hops from Bavaria. So Pretty good okay. beer, light, easy drinking. I, I mean, I took the one sip. It's pretty good. Um, I think there are two fortunate guys to come together and make a brewery. It sounds pretty nice to have that friendship. Um, I wish I had more friends that were CFOs for, uh, you know, funds and have all that money and can help me <laughs> pursue my hopes and dreams. But, you know, maybe one day, one day we'll be there. Yeah. What about you? What are you drinking? So I have Modern Dune is the brewery. It's a subsidiary of Dunier Artisan Fermenta Project. The beer I have is a modern Kolsch style ale. So I think, you know, I've done Junior Artisan Fermenta Project way back, um, you know, in the podcast days here. And they launched this modern Dune subsidiary shortly after. So I haven't had a chance to try this beer yet. So I have the Kolsch. It gets a 3.71 on untapped. It's 4.7%. It's really good, smooth Kolsch. And what makes this Kolsch different is it has Hallertau, Blanc hops. So it's made to be kind of fruity, which is a little bit different from a typical Kolsch. Um, and these hops have wine like qualities. So there's there, it's like a gooseberry in grass is the notes that they say. You're picking those up. Uh, it's similar to that of a Sauvignon Blanc. And what uh Dunier Fermenta's, you know, what sets them apart, their craft brewery segment focuses on the co-fermentation of wine, cider, and mead ingredients with artisanal craft beer. So they create co-fermented hybrids, vineyard ales, and mixed culture saisons huh. with modern approaches. Um, they adapt the methods of natural winemakers, cider makers, and craft brewers alike, and they blur the lines of craft beer, you know, wine, mead, all that together. This modern Dune uh, moniker good. is used to promote the clean lagers, IPAs, Kolsch style beers. Um, it's really good. Yeah, it's definitely different. It feels elevated. It feels like uh, I'm drinking something, you know, like I'm going to drink this with dinner or something like that. Uh, it's a good beer, though. And they actually contract brewed out of Motor Row Brewing until Motor, Ro Motor Row went under during the pandemic. And then they took over Motor Row space. So, you know, from one brewery to the next, they took over the space in 2021. And Modern Dune launched shortly thereafter. Similarly, we our next guest is somebody who's been taking over in Chicago for a while. <laughs> our next guest is Tony Gill. He's at the Tony Gill on Twitter. He produces and creates digital conversations for 670 The Score, NBC Sports Chicago, Sports Adjacent, and The Ringer, the Full Go podcast with Jason Goff. Tony, thanks so much for taking some time to be here with us today. Oh, no, I'm the one really benefiting from this. Like, <laughs> from a guy that doesn't drink, I learned so much about Mandarin grapes and like <laughs> <laughs> fermenting. And I was like, Oh, like I don't drink, but that's, that sounds very tasty guys. Uh, it's a complex it a process, try. right? <laughs> <laughs> so Tony, uh, has sports media always been your goal? Is this kind of the path you've been set on or was there something that happened in your past that kind of, that kind of turned you on to sports media? Uh, I had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it does. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
Uh, so it took me a little bit. It took me a little while uh, to kind of figure it out. Um, I thought I was going to go to IT and yeah. I was pretty good in it, you know, but you know, I had teachers who all had similar temperaments and attitudes and uh, I mean, nice people, don't get me wrong, but I'm like, do I imagine myself working with these type of people for the rest of my life, knowing the <laughs> type of personality that I am? And it was absolutely not. Yeah. So I kind of checked out almost like a year into college. <laughs> um, and, you know, I finished, got my associates or whatever, uh, but did nothing with it. So it took me a while to kind of really sit down and, and figure it out. And uh, I kind of leaned on my faith and, and, and God to try and, you know, there's nothing worse, at least for me, than not knowing what I'm doing or mm -hmm. not knowing where I'm going to go in life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really, really scary for me. Uh, heading in my early 20s, no clue. I was working. Um, I worked for a law, uh, a uh, health clinic, doing shipping and receiving, and then a law firm. Uh, just no real direction in my life. Uh, and then I realized I enjoy talking about sports yeah, and talking sports with people that I like. And I was a fan of 670, the score. Uh, we'll listen to it all the time on the radio. I grew up listening to it, essentially. My father always played it. Uh, and I was like, I, they could teach me how to press buttons. I got a pretty okay enough personality. Let's let's see what this is like. And, you know, it just kind of shot up for, for, from there. Um, and did you intern how I got started. with did you intern with them? First? Yeah, how did you get your foot I, in the door? I did, actually. And it was crazy because um, the intern of that era, I was like the second to the last group to actually intern at 670 The Score. So it was kind of like, you know, was I really meant to do this being, you know, that was the, the way to get my foot in the door. And it was the last or one of the last groups to ever intern there. So um, I, I actually went to the Illinois media school uh, because I knew they had all the connections. I didn't know mm -hmm. what they were going to teach me, but I know people that were in the industry were connected there and I just needed to get a hold of them to let them know that I'm really passionate about this. And I'm literally willing to do anything because this is my final straw. Like I had mm -hmm. no backup plan. I had no idea what I wanted to do after that. I just knew I couldn't do what I was currently doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I just took that leap of faith and in, in, in that risk. And I was fortunate enough that my parents didn't kick me out the house, <laughs> you know, so I had, you know, the safety net of actually, you know, going all in and taking a part-time job to do this free internship. Uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, I, I went to Illinois Media School, got a hold, a name and email and phone number. That's all I needed. And I went on my path of trying to get to know people. And uh, Brendan McCaffrey, he responded to a random email about wanting to intern. Um, and he gave me my shot and my opportunity. So he's the one that opened the door. Uh, so shout out to BMAC, a.k.a. Baldy McGrindy. <laughs> That's from awesome. <laughs> That's for, to, for giving this kid a shot. He appreciates that nickname, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so now you've got so many projects going on. I guess, you know, a recurring theme we've heard on this show is there's people that just don't say no to things. Is that you? Would you put yourself in that category? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, um, <laughs> you know, you work so hard uh, to be reached out to, to be a guest, right? Like mm -hmm. on, on, on this show, you like, you know, you work so hard to get to a certain place. It's like, I can't say no to people um, mm -hmm. because I know how hard it was to get to, to where I am um, when people thought I sucked, <laughs> you know, at, at everything, <laughs> which I did, right. You know, you got to learn and grow and mature right. and uh, get better, especially how, you know, young I was like, I had no idea how to formulate a show or say words without saying like after every three seconds, you know, like it takes a, effort to do in a, in a mental focus to do all those things so I, I just can't say no to people and yeah if if there's an opportunity and if my wife lets me <laughs> um, I'm, I'm gonna you know help somebody out or oh you want to have a conversation about how to get into business or whatever okay let's do that that's great because I know how difficult it is to to get in this position and I just want to reach out to people and and my friend Lawrence Holmes, he teaches at DePaul and he's a big proponent of uh, lift as you climb. Hmm. And I am a huge advocate for that and recipient of that. Lawrence has been my mentor since I joined, you know, sports media. 
He's given me opportunities. He's helped me out a lot. And I want to do that and have been doing that since I've gotten, you know, where I am today. So, you know, you never know who's going to be your boss, right? You never yeah, know, right. Uh, <laughs> you know who's going to uh, be a colleague. So I never want to disrespect or any or not reach out or reach back out to anybody that uh, that, that wants to join. And it's a it's a big pool of fun that everybody can have. So I'm, I'm I, I try to you know be open with everybody. Nice. That's like great advice to give. I, I, we had some questions come up like, what advice would you give people trying to break in? But I think you kind of just hit on it. Um, you said earlier that you were listening to 670 growing up. Your father always had it on Chicago sports fan, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. uh, and now you're working in the media of the sports industry. Are there people that you've met and any like starstruck moments that you get to work with? And you're like, I can't believe I'm here right now talking to this person or that I met this mm -hmm. person. Any kind of people that you've seen throughout your career have gotten the chance to work or talk to that you've kind of almost had that starstruck moment? Yeah, uh, a lot of people say because, I, you know, I've covered all the teams, at least for a season uh, in Chicago uh, on the beat. And people always think that, oh, you saw this player or, you know, oh, you saw that player. I'm not really awestruck by players. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, I, it was weird because, you know, I, uh, I went to I covered a Lakers game last year or two years ago, LeBron was there. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's LeBron James. You know, that's cool. But also, did you see Shams hanging out? <laughs> you know, by the, <laughs> by the lunch table? Uh, or, sports media? Yeah, or yeah. Uh, you know, Casey Johnson? Or are those your Joe idols? Kali, those are your like idols? The, yeah, yeah. The people yeah. that have the opinions, the people that uh, document mm. all of this stuff that we watch, and not just the game. Of course, I love the games, right? I mean, these are, you know, the top 1% of the top 1% of the population doing this very specific thing. So, of course, I love and, and, and watching these things live. But for me, it was the people that had the opinions and, 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 and writing the way that I think sports should be covered in a truthfully honest but respectful way that made me awestruck. Like, the, the media room is what, got to me and realized like wow i am these are my colleagues now like it, it was such a it yeah. was such a great feeling um knowing that i can reach out to these people to come on shows and it's not like weird or anything mm -hmm. like that like i can cold call or cold email somebody and say hey i'm from this place and blah 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 could you come on the show or can i book you as a guest or something like that and it won't be weird they won't be like, what? Who's this weird person reaching out to me? Like having those connections and developing those relationships with these people, I think is probably the the, the most exciting and invigorating part of, or, of the job. So, so you to have, be clear, so you a, yeah, you'd rather go, go to dinner with um, Woj, Woj, Adrian Wojnarowski than LeBron James. That's what you're, yes. <laughs> that's what you're saying. Yes. Really? I can't, okay. I, I can't be LeBron James. <laughs> I, I can make a connection with Woj though. That's great. Okay. I love that. I like that. I like that. Um, you know, obviously, since you've got into the into sports media and, you know, up until today, I'm sure a lot has changed. There's a lot of different current trends and, and things that have changed throughout the years. Is there anything that you like or don't like, you know, now versus when you started? I, I would imagine podcasts weren't as big of a thing uh, back when you broke in. But, you know, here you are on this show. <laughs> um, is there I mean, is there anything that, that you think changed for the better or changed for the worse over the years? Uh, okay. I'll start with the better. I think that podcasting being made available for everyone is a benefit. Uh, and because I firmly believe, and this is something that I, that I struggled with early on, uh, even before I got into media was really questioning how interesting I am and what people actually want to hear what I wanted to say. And that was, that was a big thing for me to overcome. And what I had to realize is everybody is interesting. Everybody has a story. It's just how do you present that story? And how do you present uh, yourself uh, and being the truest part of yourself? Uh, not just, you know, what you think people may like. It's being the authentic you because people are connected to the authenticity. So I always encourage people because podcasting is such a great medium. Uh, and it, seem, it might seem 
overwhelming because it's so much space and so much room to get out what you have to say. But after you do it a couple of times and be able to hear your own voice and get used to hearing your own voice, it's really cathartic. And no matter really what topic you're on uh, in terms of sports wise, people get that insight and it feels good to be your truest self um, and not really, you know, think about if, if people are going to like it, you know, or not the best part about it is I got myself out there yeah. uh, for other people. So the way podcasting has transformed the, the medium uh, where you can do it yourself, you don't need a platform. You can create your own platform. I think it's for the better. And, I, and that's what I enjoy most. Uh, I guess what I don't like about what's happened in sports media is the, the inability to, Hmm. All right. How can I put this? When people don't respect the safe space that we're in, uh, and that is you know, hot take culture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's also people being very, very sensitive. Um, those are the two things that I think is worst about the business is if you want to have a true conversation, a good faith conversation, you should be able to have that conversation uh, without pushback or not pushback. I'm sorry. You should get pushback if it deserves it, uh, but without being harmed of being canceled or being dismissed as an individual, if you are having the good faith conversation and that kind of bleeds into the hot take uh, world where people aren't having good faith conversations. They yeah. want to rile up people just because of the rile up and they do not believe what they're saying whatsoever. They just want the reaction. Mm -hmm. It's the worst part of this business, but it's the, it's the part that makes the most money. Right. And yep. people see the views and they see the clout that they can get from being a hot take artist that they don't know the damage that they're doing because for the most part, people don't know if you're lying to them or not. If yeah. you are saying things loud enough and hard enough, people aren't going to know the difference. And then they're going to take your word as a person with this platform and go and take it the next step further. Uh, I just hate the way, and it's not just in sports, it's, it's in politics, it's in all media. Uh, any, yeah. It's in all media. It's impacting every uh, uh, media space. And that sucks because I think the, the interesting is when people have these great conversations that leads to the funniest of the funny to lead to the uh, somebody opening their minds to something that they never, you know, experienced before. So those are probably the, the, the best and the worst parts about uh, just media in general for, for me. I think that, yeah. that was yeah so well said. And then I just want to go uh, a little bit back. I, I loved how you said, you know, the, the positives of, you know, being able to produce yourself and, and do something organically on your own and, and put it out there. And then you yourself, you know, are people going to like this and put it out there and get that reaction? Is there a piece that you've done that you, you know, you kind of just, you hold it as your baby and like, that's your favorite thing you've done so far. You put it out there and it was maybe well received or maybe it wasn't. You're just so damn proud of it. Um, yeah, uh, I did a, a documentary uh, podcast doctor the very first time I ever done this venture and I was still working at the score and I was working with uh, Julie DeCaro mm -hmm. uh, on the project and it is the uh, the murder of Michael Jordan's father uh, we did a 10 or 11 episode series uh, on it it's out there in the internet world somewhere find it where um, you can find podcasts but yeah yeah <laughs> just you know search the uh, you know the murder behind behind the headlines I think it, it was a series and it was the very first thing uh, that I've done in terms of real storytelling. Uh, I was only producing radio shows, but I had this urge to tell stories and uh, use my voice. Like I got a face for radio, so I got a, a pretty okay voice to uh, uh, to speak on things and, and to say things in a impactful way. So that was the first time I've ever done any voiceover work, pieced together a uh, documentary style, and that it didn't get you know a lot a lot of listens. But that's the one that I'm most proud of because mm -hmm. it had to do with a lot of research. We got to talk to the guy that is convicted for that murder. We got to talk to his lawyer. We got to talk to the people that convicted him. We got, I mean, we got 
into so many spaces that I thought I would never get into. Uh, and of course we tried for Michael and he obviously declined, right. uh, but being able to tell a story and flesh it out and get the ear of the listener with how I produce, I think is, is the most glorifying thing that I, I've done in my career. Uh, I will always have that, you know, it's on a hard, hard drive somewhere yeah. uh, that I have. And I want to be able to give that to, you know, my future children, like, you know, Hey, I did some pretty cool stuff when I was younger. Uh, and I was a part of some pretty cool stuff um, as well. So that, that one, and then oddly enough, the, the, my first big venture at NBC and the primary reason why they hired me, uh, I did another uh, documentary style episode on the Michael Jordan facts, the I'm back hmm. uh, series. And I did it for NBC national. And I think it, it, I think it just got beat out like recently as the, the highest downloaded episode in NBC history, That's awesome. NBC national history. So it was there a top there for, for a long while before it got dethroned, but I am really, really proud of that producing all of that uh, myself in terms of sound wise. Um, and then be able to voice the entire thing again as well. Like I know I was just pitching it as an idea. Um, and hopefully we were going to get, you know, more of a professional to voice it. But once mm -hmm. they heard it, they were like, no, nah, you, you, you gotta be the guy. So, uh, having that opportunity and chance, and then that getting validated with the numbers, I think was probably my second, you know, favorite thing I've done in my career. That's really cool. That's great. Um, yeah. What about upcoming projects? Do you have anything in the works right now? Anything that you can share with us? Um, not anything big, uh, right now, right now, I'm just trying to expand the, uh, the NBC network, uh, right now past the traditional five team, you know, sports right mm -hmm. now we're working with, uh, Telemundo sport cat sports caster, Hector Lozano, uh, on us all Spanish, uh, sports podcast. Um, that that's a market that, I've envied because there are a lot of Spanish speakers who enjoy sports right? Uh, mm -hmm. that may not speak the language or we're just more comfortable listening to uh, something in their native tongue. And with the baseball here, the true goal is to get these, some of these players uh, to speak candidly and openly and honestly, uh, not through a translator, but in their first language. Mm -hmm. uh, and not force them to pick up a second language and uh, try to explain themselves in the truest sense in another language when they can do it very well in, in their first language. So I love uh, that. That's something I'm working on. Uh, I want to do a politics podcast too for NBC um, that that's going to uh, come up. Um, so yeah, I got, I got a couple ideas that, that I want to, that I want to do. I can't really share too much right now, but uh, we'll be following you. Yeah, they let yeah. you run with them. If, you know, if you come up with something, I mean, probably probably at this point, they know you know you've had the success that you've had, and they mm -hmm. just let you run with you know some of these ideas you have. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that I can't complain about. Uh, the score, <laughs> you know, obviously it's very restrictive. You know, you come in, you do your show, uh, and then yeah. then you head out. There's really not much after. But NBC is really giving me the platform, the power uh, to do what I want to do. Um, I, I rarely get a no. That's and great. The, the, the moment I start stacking no's is, is the time where I, I, I'm going to have to start looking else, elsewhere. <laughs> but so far, NBC has been great. Um, and they, they've given, truly given me a, a large platform and uh, uh, the room to really spread my wings into other and many other things, television, voiceover work for TV, uh, TV pr production, like all these other things that I'm allowed to be a part of and, and learn uh, from most of all is kind of what I, what I most value there. That's great. That's really awesome. Let's talk about something that's not great and not awesome. And that's our Chicago bulls really quickly uh, <laughs> before we get you out of here, they got in the playoffs by being the, or not the playoffs to play in. Well, mm -hmm. well, we'll leave that to you. Do you consider this the playoffs? No, no, no. Okay. No, come on. Now. So they're in the they're in the playing game. The the number ten seed, right? They're playing the Raptors tomorrow, uh, Wednesday. The nine seed. How how are we feeling about this team's chances going into the playing game? Uh, not very good. Uh, and it, it's 
<laughs> I mean, it's, it's nothing personal against them, but they just don't match up well against this, against this team. Yeah. Um, the, the Bulls have issues rebounding. They have issues with size and length. Uh, and I, I don't know if you got there. There was a running joke a few years back with the uh, St. Louis Cardinals that, you know, they always have an unnamed player ready to, you know, plug and play. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever they play the code, yeah. it's that's like Raptors. random player X come up and uh, do this thing. And that's kind of like with the Raptors. Everybody is six, nine with a seven, two wingspan. <laughs> and, and that annoys wow. the bulls uh, and Nick nurse, you know, obviously his job seems to be, you know, his job security seems to be in flux. Uh, well, not security. He's he, he's going to work somewhere, but his status in, in Toronto seems to be waning just because of the amount of years he's stacked up over there. Mm -hmm. But man, he's a real coach out there. He will throw everything out there at you to confuse you. Uh, I like that about him, that he's willing to try and see what his team is capable of to its fully, fullest capacity. Uh, and we know what this Bulls team is and we know what their weaknesses are. And if they don't play a near perfect game, they're going to lose. So again, this is a one-off. Anything can happen in a one-off. Right. Uh, but just the matchup isn't the best for the Bulls, I think. Yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see where it goes. And uh, do you have any predictions for the future of this this team? Last question before we get you out. Getting rid of Vooch, trading DeMar. Uh, what are we doing? Blowing it up? Uh, why yeah. didn't they do it this year? Come on. What the heck? They, will, they won't blow it up. They've already kind of switched missed the on, window on that yeah i feel like it's they, everything's up in the air this could be a completely different roster next year that's my opinion yeah i i do think there's a chance that this could be a different roster i know that they don't have the urgency to take a step back at all um when they first got in right their message was draft and development and they quickly got rid of that i don't know if that was on them mm -hmm. or yeah. on ownership to make sure butts are back in seats yeah uh, as quickly as possible if it if it's that i am i will be not surprised but also disappointed because i was looking forward to draft and development because yeah. that's what it takes now when you can't get big time free agents which technically they they still can't they traded for booch they Science resigned trades. zach levine yeah. and the bulls were not demar derozan's first choice and he's not a superstar yeah so um I thought draft and development was going to be the way to go. Uh, it, they haven't shown that Kobe white is, is probably their shining achievement. And I think that was majority Kobe white putting in the work because mm -hmm. he's been on the trading block for the last two years. So um, there's a lot that this bulls team needs to get done in terms of internally before they even make another thought about trading for somebody else or trading or pivoting to another superstar. There's a lot of internal work that they, that needs to happen. And, um, you know, maybe they take a slight step back by, by, you know, getting rid of Zach or, or DeMar and, and try and find a pivot. But I think they're in a very interesting corner, not wanting to take, take a step back, but also trying to add and, and build around what they have. So I'm very much interested this off season. I'm already thinking about the off season. I'm not yeah. really concerned I think most about what Bulls fans are too. I think most yeah. Bulls fans are too. Yeah. It's like, would you prefer this or Garpax? Ooh, that is a good question. That is a good <laughs> question. I'm going to say this just because it still feels relatively new. You still got to give them a uh, chance. AK we know what Garpax say. was, right? Yeah. We, yeah. We, yeah. I, I, I still want to, you know, we gave Garp. Well, we didn't give them, but they had all, <laughs> you know, all, a decade and a half. They time. took, I can they give took those years few, from us. <laughs> I, I can give this new regime uh, a, a new look uh, and, and some time to figure it out. But I just need some honesty. Yeah, you that's true. Up. Yeah, I, that's all I need. Just don't gas like the fan base is my thing. Like, yeah. acknowledge what we see when you watch this team and don't try and double down on it. When we all know that this one has a ceiling and two ultimately broke down and disintegrated before our eyes. Yeah, love it. All right. Thanks again. This has been Tony Gill. You can find him on Twitter at the Tony Gill on Twitter. Again, he produces and creates digital conversations for 670 Score, NBC Sports Chicago, Sports Adjacent, and also the Full Goal podcast on The Ringer with Jason Golf. Tony, thank you so much for being here tonight, man. Appreciate it. Thanks, Tony. No problem. Reach back out anytime. I love this. This was fun. This was fun watching you guys drink beer, too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a child. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, it's hard work. Don't it's hard drink. work. Someone's yeah. got to do it, but it's tough. <laughs> Thanks, man.
All right. That was Tony Gill. Again, you can find him on Twitter at the Tony Gill. Lift as you climb, Dan. You know, Tony, it's just, just sometimes we have people on this podcast that just you can just tell this is just a good person and they yeah. just have good advice. And that's what Tony was. And so big shout out to Tony. Thanks for coming on the show. Yep. Um, he gave us his thoughts on the Bulls. Dan, I'm curious, what are your thoughts on this game that's coming up? Yeah, um, I agree with, uh, you know, Tony's take on how they don't match up well. Um, I mean, just looking at the roster of the Raptors, the starting five is probably going to be Fred Van Vliet, Gary Trent, OG, Scotty Barnes, Pascal. Scotty Barnes is kind of what we wanted Patrick Williams to be. He's much better. He's younger. Pascal is so hard to guard because he's so tall and lanky and fast and, and kind of just creative and can get to the bucket, can play really good defense. And I mean, Vooch is not going to be able to guard him on the perimeter. And if they put them in at center, he's going to have a tough time or they'll have Pirtle there as well. Jakob Pirtle, um, who's been kind of bodying up Vooch lately. I don't know. Uh, as a Bulls fan, I'm, I'm thinking optimistically. I'm like, all right, they're going to, this whole team has struggled all year with like focus and effort and competing. And they've just been knowing that they'll, they'll do just enough to make the playoffs and then start playing. Maybe they win into the playing uh, tournament. They win against the Raptors and then they beat whoever loses against the Hawks and the heat. I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be the Hawks and they can beat the Hawks. And then they just get absolutely demolished by the bucks. Again. It's a long so, road. Yeah. So Long it's like, I mean, what are we doing here? It's just, yeah, you know, talking to other Bulls fans and friends. It's just, uh, you feel sick to your stomach because you thought, you know, with new uh, um, GM and front office that things were going to be different, but it feels oddly similar to the, you know, the state of the Bulls where it's just like purgatory, where it's like, you're not good enough to compete. You're not bad enough to tank for the top five and you just suck and everything sucks. And that's where we're at. So yay, Wednesday, I'm going to be watching. I'll be tuning yeah. in. I'll still be so, rooting, you know. I'll still be a fan, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I just like that Raptors roster, honestly. What you just named off there, Scotty Barnes too. I think I'm a big fan of him. Yeah, but the two, he can play the three, he can play the four, he can guard anybody. I mean, yeah, He's Fred stud, Scrappy, OG, like, shoots it. Yeah. Siakam, all those guys are just like lanky, and they can guard everyone. I mean, everybody yeah. plays good defense. I feel like if Patrick Williams was drafted by the Raptors, he would be great by now. Yeah. Do you do you disagree with that? No, and it's it's hard though too, right? It's like I mean Toronto like basketball, to like I mean, maybe it's a bigger media uh, scrutiny than I, I I figure, but I just feel like Chicago media gets the players here sometimes, and they're just not ready for it. You get them too young, and it ruins them, and they're you know they get in their own heads, and it screws up their whole entire game. They don't get any like space or you know anonymity to to really be themselves and grow. The Mitch Trubisky effect, I like to call exactly, it. Exactly, exactly, exactly. All right, so that's Bulls, man. I'm done talking Bulls, but I want to talk baseball because it's been fun. Uh, you know, new season started. We got some new rules, pitch clock in there, no shifts, bigger bases. Game's been faster. Uh, and yeah, what do you are, think about the new rules? Let's start there. I think, you know, if you've listened to the podcast, you know that I've kind of been in favor for all the changes. I'm totally with it. I think, you know, ball's been in play more. Uh, it's kind of just been more... Uh, the spirit of the game, I think, has been lifted to what it like the true, true essence of it, right? Of just like get the ball, throw the ball, hit the ball kind of thing, instead of like taking a minute and a half to get your grip right or get the pitch right and and really being like surgical and precise about it, and instead just like playing a game because it is a game. Um, so I like it. I, I like the no shift too. Um, you know, ball's gonna drop, it's gonna drop, get runs in, get players on. Like the games are fun, they're fast mm -hmm. and they're fun. You yeah, no, I love that. I love that the games are sped up. Um, I just, you know, the shift thing, I didn't think was going to be as big of a deal as it has been. It's only been, a, you know, really like a week into the season, but the league batting average is up from last year already, and you're already seeing the differences. You know, there's more hits. Um, and when you think about the beginning of the season, it's typically a really slow start. I think the league average is usually like 230, mm -hmm. 235, something like that. I mean, it's cold, you know, in a lot of these places, and guys just aren't hitting yet beginning of the year kind of still coming off of you know maybe they had spring training but they didn't have that much time to get into the the summer months when everyone starts hitting it, they're up to 248 i mean that's a pretty big difference already so far it's only been a week sure but um a lot more hits definitely a lot more runs being scored i think there's uh and an, the average before was about four runs now it's four and a half so that's kind of a big difference too we're seeing more runs we're seeing more hits and stolen bases are up by a lot. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, the league average is typically about one, and now it's 1.3. So you think, okay, it's just 0.3, but that, I mean, that's a big difference. There's been a lot more stolen bases overall this year so far than there has been in the past. And it's just because the base is just a little bit bigger. Yeah. I didn't think that that was going to be, I think it's going to make that much of a change. I mean, I think it's also pitch clock too. It's it's pitch clock. So pitchers are timing up the pitch clock, timing it up and also forgetting a little bit about who's on first because they they're thinking about getting the pitch in and getting what they want to throw on the same page with the catcher. So I think it's a little bit of that as well. Let me ask you about this Cubs team, man. A lot of new faces. I think the biggest one obviously is Swanson. Um, So I want to hear your take though, like watching this roster play, any other players standing out to you or, or like how this roster is made up? Like, what are you feeling? I think Eric Osmer's looked pretty good. Yeah. I think uh, I've been surprised by how, how he's played Cody Bellinger's first couple of games. I was like, Oh, is this the old Cody Bellinger that we're getting here? And then he started to hit again. Um, so much so that I dropped him in fantasy like right away. <laughs> and then uh, now I'm re- really regretting that I actually dropped him for Rizzo I was trying to get the Oof. Cubs glory days back on my roster and then lost okay. to you in fantasy. Um, yeah. But You know, I think Cody Bellinger is going to have a great season, especially when it gets warm. I think he's going to be real good. So I'm liking what I'm seeing out of him. I'm liking what I'm seeing out of Hosmer. Dansby Swanson has been fantastic. Nico Horner in the, in the one spot. I love that. I think he's a great leadoff hitter. He's been hitting really well, won the game the other night, you know, with that walk off. Mm -hmm. I mean, what more could you ask for out of, out of this team right now? Uh, I think they've been playing playing really well. I think the pitching has been good, but I've really liked Justin Steele's performance so far. I think he looks like, is he the ace of this team? I mean, really? I mean, yeah, he looks really good. He looks really good. And then like the stories last year of like being under Lester's tutelage and kind of just, you know, Lester in his ear and kind of still semi working with the team, but not really officially, but being like Justin Steele's go-to guy. um, I can see that being emulated in that kind of he you know nothing like flashy right like he's not gonna like have these strikeouts or these pitches where you're like oh look, that guy's stuff is nasty but he's just good just knows mm-hmm. how to get a batter out he knows how to place the ball where he wants it and yeah he's looking great um stroman's been looking good too i think he's kind mm-hmm. of settling in uh after his first year last year uh i know as we're recording was nesky pitch tonight he's on my fantasy team got absolutely lit up um, hasn't had a good start, a lot of hype out of spring training, but we'll see how he kind of goes. And then, uh, the other... with Caleb Killian too, yeah. man, remember when he was coming up? So, I mean, yep. I'm not entirely shocked by this, but there was a lot of hype for Wesneski for sure. And then the hope is that, you know, Suzuki's going to be back here and, uh, sooner than later, he's already uh, played a rehab game. He's got a couple hits. He's played the field. So he's going to be joining the club pretty, pretty soon out in uh right field. And you got your outfield of Hap, Bellinger and Suzuki. That's it's pretty good, man. I, I, mm-hmm. I like what we're starting here, and it's it's starting to feel, it's starting to percolate. I think Cubs fans are starting to feel the momentum. Mo's big, big factor in, in a sports team, right? And I think the Cubs got the Mo. I think uh, so. If you look at where the Cardinals are at, I'm pretty, I'm shocked by where the Cardinals are at. Honestly, three and seven. They, yeah, I think they dropped the last two to the Rockies in Colorado. I was really surprised by that because um, that team looks a lot more loaded. And I think it'll even out for sure over the course of the year. Sure. But uh, them being down at three and seven and last, I mean, the Brewers have looked really good. And that's, yeah. you know, I don't know if that's sustainable with some of these young guys that they have. The Pirates, you know, at seven and four, they're not going to keep that's that not gonna, I mean, no, they're going to, yeah, they're going to fall down. Right. But I think the Cubs could sneakily move their way up into that second team in the central and have a shot at a wild card i think with the way things are looking right now it's only a weekend you know but i i like what we're seeing here if we can get the pitching to shake out all right maybe if hendrix comes back and looks okay yeah and uh wesneski picks it up or Killian comes up and looks all right and um i think they'll be i think they'll be okay what do you think what do you what's your prediction for yeah, I like I, I like that. I, um, wild card sounds fun. That sounds like uh, the good spot, uh, yeah. a good spot for the Cubs to be in. Um, I think they. I'd be happy be, with that. Yeah, I think maybe a couple more arms back into the bullpen. I mean, Fulmer's been looking all right as a closer, but you could you could always use more arms in the pen. So I, I would like to see that solidify the starting rotation there. Maybe yeah, maybe Hendricks does come up or or what, but uh bats are are lively and and they always show the graphic every time you watch a cubs game they just show the 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 defensive uh 
lineup and all the gold gloves that are there next to those players names so uh Mm -hmm. defense is at a premium on the north side but yeah i like that i'll I'll, kind of double down with you wild card yeah i love it all right let's do a fast back band before we get out of here what do you got air came out on april 5th so we're just a few days after that i want to see it so bad i haven't seen it yet either it's really good reviews but uh, the fast fact here is related to the Jordan uh, 1 and the shoe that came out 1984 was actually banned from games. Do you remember this? Do you know yeah, the story it, of this? It was. Your... I'm, I'm pretty sure it was banned because it didn't match like the percentage of color of the uniform that they're wearing because it had like black in it or something and the Bulls don't have black in their jersey. So yeah, he wasn't allowed to wear it because it didn't match their jersey colors. Yeah, so when Jordan started in the NBA, Commissioner David Stern had implemented a rule that sneakers worn by players on the court had to be mostly white. But MJ debuted his Jordans in a different color, so it went against league standards at the time. Baller. And he actually got fined. You know what the fine was per game at the time? For, for wearing those shoes per game in the, what was it, probably like 500 bucks? This is in the 80s. $5,000 per $5, each game. Yeah, and so, you know, the NBA sent a letter to nike about mj's actions but that wasn't enough so uh nike ended up paying for paying the fine yeah why not and uh you know the rest is history it actually made the shoe more popular with the fans you know when everyone heard that nike was paying for that and that they these were banned so yeah it's pretty cool interesting little thing i'm sure a lot of people knew that already but you know five thousand bucks in the 80s i think that was a lot back then and uh pretty interesting story i can't (laughs) (laughs) right and I, I can't wait to see that movie. I think it's going to be fantastic. Yes. Yeah, but uh, that's been our show. Thanks again to our guest, Tony Gill, for joining us. For Dan Slook, I'm Evan Bierman. You've been listening to the Domestic Draft Podcast. If you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to rate the show. You can find us on Twitter at Domestic Draft, on Instagram at Domestic Draft Podcast. Our website is domesticdraft.com. You can watch the show on YouTube. Just search up Domestic Draft and drop us a sub. Thanks again for listening. Cheers. Cheers.